moving on to uh, a legislation which is a contract law that was part of the 1872 indian contract act but later on was considered uh, necessary to make a separate legislation called the sale of goods act of 1930 friends you will notice that uh, this is a very very important legislation for many reasons as uh, we would discuss uh, in detail uh, but i think uh, probably not significantly covered sometimes or not emphasized so much upon in contractual terms and conditions but if you see the sale of goods act is a very very comprehensive legislation that actually promotes uh, trade and commerce in goods as distinct probably from other kinds of contract that could be say contract for services or contract of work so sale of goods creates that special uh, legislation and uh, uh, for example if you just try and look at the comparison between sale of goods act and the indian contract act you will notice that the indian contract law defines the remedies for breach as being damages and looking into the law of unjust enrichment and restitution these are the two remedial provisions that the indian contract act 1872 still has however you will notice that the complementary legislation in terms of remedies for breach are there in the specific relief act wherein the specific relief act uh, does speak about remedies such as specific performance of a contract which now is a rule it talks about substituted performance of a contract which was introduced in 2018 it talks about rectification and cancellation of an instrument it talks about injunction and several other uh, types of remedies which are important now when you compare those remedies that we have discussed so far with the remedies that are there under the sale of goods act you will notice that the sale of goods act 1930 gives certain additional remedies for contract for sale of goods and they are quite interestingly different for example uh what the remedies that the sale of goods act uh, identifies is what we call as the rights of an unpaid seller so even after the sale has taken place but the unpaid uh, unpaid the seller who has made a sale but he is yet to get his price he has been given certain very extraordinary rights under the sale of goods act this very clearly means that the drafters of those days very clearly said that you know you don't have to rush to the courts to get remedies you can exercise remedies as provided in the statute we are informing you of your rights so you please go ahead and exercise the same so what we would what uh, we would want to call them as equitable statutory remedies or rights granted to contracting parties the sale of goods act says that an unpaid seller can uh, you know stop goods in transit yeah so Uh, you know if the goods are yet to reach the buyer he can recall the goods because he is not yet paid and the right to stop goods in transit uh, is given to a seller if he comes to know that the buyer has turned insolvent and if he is not going to be uh, if there is a suspicion that he would not be given the price for the sale so this is a, a kind of an interesting remedy provided uh, for uh, a seller and you will notice that the sale of goods act equips the sellers with rights so that uh, you know they can go ahead uh, and trade and they can seek the protection of the law in case they are not paid uh, for the same similarly you will find another interesting right that is mentioned in the sale of goods act is called the suit for the price or suing for the price of the goods this is something that the sellers can definitely go to the court and sue for the price and let us make this distinction that a suit for a price is different from a suit for damages right so in damages the the rule is that you have to suffer some kind of a loss there has to be a damage and the proof of damage is the quantification of damages right so this is critical if one uh, tries to understand the conceptualization on the law of damages a uh, proof is required and uh, what can this proof be it can be proof of say loss of business uh, uh, loss of contract price it can be injury to person or property so on and so forth however when you talk about a sale of goods or a contract for the sale of goods if suppose i have sold these goods to you and you are you have not given me price for the same uh, look you may still say look that's a breach because payment of price is considered breach right 
but then you know i have to say that the price is in the form of damage not only required because you're not then going to show that there has been some kind of a damage you will just say i need to uh, record my price i will sue for the price and the price is something that i have to get plus probably if i have suffered delay in the payment of the price i should be given damages as well so suit for price is an additional remedy that is provided under the sale of goods act which is distinct from probably a suit for damages for if you further go and look at the sale of goods act it interestingly uh, speaks about um, you know uh, the aspects of what we call as a uh, special damages there is a clear provision in the sale of goods act where special damages can be awarded now what does special damages actually mean it means that look if uh, let's assume uh, it is the buyer and he has informed the seller uh, why he needs these goods and if suppose there is a delay in the uh, delivery of the goods he may suffer uh, extraordinary losses and this is already informed to the seller and despite the seller knowing uh, his consequences in a contract for breach uh, the seller actually commits a breach of contract then the buyer will be entitled to special damages now special means extraordinary special means more than uh, nominal damage and special damages could also include loss of profit or loss of income that could uh, have been generated if the goods had been delivered on time so the concept on special damages is provided uh, and this is based on the prior information to the parties it is based on communication between the parties it is based on the notification of the parties and hence you will notice in india that extraordinary damages or special damages is part of the jurisprudence uh, on damage unlike what we say that in india you know that kind of damage is not entertained or is not possible at times further you will notice that the sale of goods act also does not prohibit uh, from payment of interest on damage so from the time uh, the suit has been filed or from the time the breach has occurred you know the parties can have the right to claim interest on damage because finally it's not the amount that is to be given but uh, the rate of interest uh, and the loss of uh, income money that is involved in such cases also will have to be given uh, uh, in case there is a breach on uh, the sale of goods these are certain factors which make the sale of goods act a very important piece of legislation uh, for contracts especially those uh, that have government contracts in which goods are actually uh, uh, the subject matter of sale further i think what is interesting under the sale of goods act is the difference between sale and agreement to sell now if one goes by section 4 you will notice that the sale of goods act for the first time in the year 1930 said that contracts can be in several stages stage 1 could be agreement to sell and stage 2 may be sale right now if you compare these two stages they are both contracts enforceable at law yeah because they should have an offer acceptance consideration object should be legal uh, it should be free consent and the party should have capacity so all the basic requirements Uh, that are there to make a contract is to be present in an agreement to sell however an agreement to sell is not sale right now why is it not sale is because usually the best example to say the two stages of a contract or the multi stages of a contract are something like this now generally we you know if we want to buy an apartment uh, we like the apartment we see the apartment and then we give a booking amount and we enter into an agreement to sell so once the booking amount or the advance is given an agreement to sell is drafted then parties are given some time to actually prepare uh, probably the sale deed prepare the sale consideration and probably apply for a home loan or etc etc and 3 months time is generally taken by the buyers to actually conclude the sale now once the complete consideration is paid or the price is paid a sale deed is executed or agreed upon then it is registered and that's how the two stage contract documentation in a apartment or a real estate project is normally being done isn't it how you will notice that both of these two kinds of contract or two stage contracts are enforceable at law however there are distinctions over here for example we say an agreement to sell is an executory contract whereas sale is an executed contract now what do you mean by the term executory contract it means that not that the performance is yet to be done or is supposed to be done it means that uh, when an agreement to sell is uh, entered into 
there are a lot of things that are still executory, not executed. They're not finalized. In an agreement to sell, there are things to be finalized. Uh, and hence, it's executory in the character of the agreement. So, this is not a complete agreement in itself, right? Sale is a complete agreement. An agreement to sell probably is the initial kind of uh, lock in between the parties. Uh, and uh, they have decided what they can decide right now. But finally, the, the things will be decided only when a sale takes place. The best example to uh, explain the executed versus executory agreement could be contract farming. Now, what happens in contract farming is, friends, suppose uh, it's Pepsi or any other multinational company that goes to a farmer and wants the farmer to, uh, you know, sow the seeds of the company. Uh, uh, because, you know, some of these companies control the seed because they have a specific requirement. Uh, it can be uh, genetically modified. It can be specially hybrid seed. And those are the seeds that have to be sown. Anyway, the company gives the seed to the farmer, the farmer has to grow the seed. But at the stage when the company and the farmer agree that this is the crop to be sown in his land, we say they enter into what is known as contract farming. Now, why is it executory in nature? It is because the parties have sealed themselves in a contract. They know each other. They know, look, this is what is uh, the expected obligation. And hence, the performance plus the contract is executory from both the parties. The, you know, that's how the contract is to be made. Now, why is it called executory? Is for the simple reason is that, look, uh, what is the seed for? Is it tomatoes or potatoes? Uh, let's assume that it is potato. Now, if it's potato, uh, it takes some time for the potatoes to grow, right? And you are not sure when an agreement to sell is made, how many kgs or quintals of potato is uh, going to be grown by the farm. Because in one season, it could be X uh, uh, kind of quantity. In another season, it could be Y quantity. So you are not sure how much you are going to buy as Pepsi. Or you are not sure as a farmer how much you are going to sell. Because that is all dependent on the crop. Second, you know, it is also dependent upon the obligations of how the potato is grown, what is the skill of the farmer, what is the quality of the uh, potatoes. And of course, you will understand that the potatoes are then graded by quality. So that is A grade, B grade. And interestingly, uh, or based on the grade, uh, say two or three months down the line when the potato crop is ready, uh, what is the price of the potatoes? Today, it may be X price, but after three months, it could be Y price. So has everything been agreed? Uh, no, it cannot be. And hence, you say, that it's executory in nature. However, the agreement is enforceable. So the farmer can sue the company, the company can sue the farmer in case there is breach at the initial stage. Uh, uh, so uh, this two-stage kind of an agreement have, was introduced in 1930, uh, kind of facilitating the reality of contracts, saying that in complex modern-day contracts, uh, it's not one document that makes a contract, there can be several documents that make a contract, and hence, the parties must probably agree which is the enforceable and the final agreement uh, to be taken to the court as evidence to prove uh, their obligations under the same. Also, you will notice that when you make this distinction between agreement to sell and sale, the rights uh, basically also differ, isn't it? Now, for example, when I say rights, you will notice that suppose the farmer uh, in an agreement to sell uh, does not sell the potatoes to Pepsi. Right? What can Pepsi do? What are the remedies for Pepsi? Right? What, okay, let's assume that the sale agreement has already been made and the farmer then does not uh, agree to sell the potatoes to Pepsi. Now, you should understand that the remedies also will differ in this case. Why they would differ is because in an agreement to sell, if the farmer uh, you know, does not want to sell the potatoes, look, he has not sold the potatoes. He has only agreed to sell. If he had sold the potatoes, then the title in the potatoes would have passed on to Pepsi. That's what sale does. Yes, sale not only ensures transfer of title, it also ensures transfer of position. So sale has these two combinations, title as well as position. Whereas in an agreement to sell, please note, uh, uh, the title does not transfer, neither the position transfers, and hence the farmer can sell to someone else. That's possible because he has just agreed to sell and not made a sale. If he does so, of course, uh, the Pepsi company cannot probably, uh, you know, object to that because they have not taken the title to it, but they can definitely sue the farmer for breach because an agreement to sell is enforceable and they can sue for damages. But suppose after sale, the farmer sells the potatoes to some third party. Please note, 
This would amount to a serious breach of contract by the farmer because he has already transferred title and he is supposed to transfer position. That was a serious breach for which the farmer could be held responsible not only for uh, uh, an ordinary breach but also for wrongful conversion uh, of uh, uh, a title in the property. And uh, uh, the third party in a sale cannot get title because the title always is already with Pepsi. Right? So, the rights vis-a-vis -vis the third party gets normally determined uh, when sale or agreement to sell actually uh, takes place. Right? So, third parties cannot get title because title is already with Pepsi. They can probably get position but you know again the position can be required from Pepsi if Pepsi requires the same to be handed over uh, as well. So, these are probably some of the consequences when you make certain kinds of these agreements and they have very significant consequences to the way we understand uh, sale of goods uh, per se.